The 93rd Academy Awards didn't look like anything you've ever seen before. COVID-19 restrictions shaped not only how audiences watched the nominated films this season, but also the presentation of the ceremony itself. The red carpet had none of its usual chaotic energy. The audience was limited to a tight group of nominees. They mostly axed the gimmicky moments that no one likes, and yet they do every single year. Best Picture was not the last category. And of course, there were the winners themselves. Ya Jung Yoon became the first Korean actress to win an Oscar. Frances McDormand took home her third and fourth Oscars, the first actress to win for producing her own movie. And Chloe Zhao became just the second woman and the first woman of color to win the Best Director Oscar. I've known for a while that I wanted to talk about Zhao on this channel. And I originally wrote a version of this video that broke down many of the specific barriers women directors face. Smaller distribution, less funding, underemployment, a trust gap, etc. But something about that version of the video felt repetitive. Not only because, well, we unfortunately have to have this representation conversation a lot, but also because this is a very well-researched topic with tons of easily Googleable information that outlines very specifically where Hollywood has fallen short. The USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative, the Center for the Study of Women in Television at Film at San Diego State, and the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media have dozens of reports that you can read about this. And I encourage you to do so. I'll link some below. So instead today, I want to pull back and think about the trends that connect the seven women who have been nominated for the Best Director Oscar. Lena Wertmuller, Jane Campion, Sofia Coppola, Catherine Bigelow, Greta Gerwig, Emerald Fennell, and Chloe Zhao, with a specific focus on Bigelow and Zhao. It's an awkward endeavor to compare this group of seven filmmakers who would seem so arbitrarily grouped were it not for their gender. But this isn't necessarily about their techniques or filmographies, so much as it is about how they're received by critics and the industry, how the themes and genres they work in affect how they're seen as filmmakers, and how their personal politics frame their director personas. This video isn't exactly comprehensive, but I hope it at least scratches your brain a bit about femininity, auteurism, and the future of women in film. Before we get started, I want to say thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. In preparation for this topic, I wanted to watch as many films directed by the seven Oscar-nominated women as I could. Lena Wertmuller's work was pretty easy to access, but Jane Campion turned out to be a little harder to find on streaming services, at least in the US. Thanks to NordVPN, all I had to do was simply switch my location to the UK, and boom, I was able to stream a film of hers I'd never seen before. With unlimited bandwidth and thousands of servers in 59 countries to choose from, you can truly enjoy the internet with no limits or borders. With NordVPN, all of your internet data stays safe behind a wall of next generation encryption. It takes no time at all to set up before I can view information, and in my case, films, that I might not see otherwise, all securely done from a phone or computer. Either works because guess what? You can connect up to six devices simultaneously on just one NordVPN account. Right now, you can get a huge discount on a two-year plan of NordVPN at nordvpn.com slash bekindrewind. And when you use my code BEKINDREWIND, you'll get an extra month free. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So take control of your internet experience today with just one click. Use the link in the description below to get in on this deal before it ends. In her 2018 profile of Chloe Zhao for Vulture, Emily Yoshida wrote, When you picture what a modern auteur of the American West should look like, Chloe Zhao isn't the stereotypical choice by a long shot. She's right, when a lot of us think auteur of American Westerns, we're likely to picture John Ford or maybe Sam Peckinpah. You might think of Clint Eastwood or John Wayne, who, though actors, seem to have a nearly authorial impact on their films nonetheless. Yoshida's opening plays on our awareness of basic film history to emphasize Zhao's subversion of a trope, but it also cuts straight to the core of what a lot of us know but rarely acknowledge that we've learned the stereotype of who a director is and what a director looks like. It's important to remember that it wasn't always this way. In the silent era when film was just a fledgling industry finding its footing in Southern California, studios trusted women like Lois Weber, Mabel Normand, and Ida Mae Park to tell their own stories. 
but a monumental shift in the industry prompted a systemic elimination of women from these positions of power. It didn't happen overnight, but I think it happened awfully quickly. And I think it happened largely for one reason, which is that the shift uh, from silent to sound happened in the late 20s and became, you know, the real marker of film's success as an industry. And Wall Street got involved with financing, you know, movies became a big business. And it was thus judged that directors needed to be men, right? The people who had uh, kind of commandeered the film sets could no longer be uh, trusted uh, to be women. In the absence of women and racial minorities in positions of power, a single homogenous group crowned each other the masters of cinema and curated a canon they deemed the most important, the best films in history, conditioning generations of cinephiles on who and what we value, award, and even who we talk about. Critic Stephanie Zacharek told Paper, even if we're just talking about male commercial filmmakers who have come to prominence since the 1970s, Scorsese, Tarantino, Spielberg, De Palma, Nolan, Fincher, we feel very comfortable discussing their individual styles or at least their specific approaches to filmmaking. But you don't hear a lot of people discussing the films of, say, Sofia Coppola or Catherine Bigelow in the same way, even though each, by this point, has a very distinctive voice. It's interesting that she chooses Coppola and Bigelow here, because contrasting the two might help illuminate part of the problem. As Todd Kennedy points out in his article, Off with Hollywood's Head, Sofia Coppola as Feminine Auteur, the source of attack for those who wish to attack her has routinely focused on a perceived lack of depth. Coppola causes critics, and often audiences, not to know what to do with her films, other than to pat her on the head for having made a pretty film that, to quote Wesley Morris, skims with style even if it is mostly surface. As proof, one need only look at the unfavorable reaction to her 2006 film, Marie Antoinette. For years, I was convinced that it wasn't worth seeing, a complete bomb, a serious misstep for her career, purely because of the critical vitriol I'd heard. And then I saw it, and I realized that it wasn't a horribly constructed film at all. It's a fun and feminine pastel playground that reimagines the historical biopic with a clear and unique sensibility. Broy Deschanel breaks down the reception to this film in depth. But in summary, what you begin to understand when you compare the actual film with the condescension of its reception is that when critics say lack of substance, what they really mean is that it's difficult to take young women seriously, or as anything more than a silly little romp. Coppola has obviously found success at the Oscars for her work as a writer, an honor she shares with both Jane Campion and Emerald Fennell. But it's difficult to imagine her winning Best Director against films like City of God, Mystic River, Master and Commander, or Lord of the Rings, all of which spill enough blood to prove just how serious they really are. Contrast this with Catherine Bigelow, a filmmaker who, from the very beginning of her career, played in genres traditionally coded with masculinity. Point Break, Blue Steel, Strange Days, and of course, The Hurt Locker. The Hurt Locker tells the story of Sergeant William James, an explosive ordnance expert assigned to find and dismantle improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, in Iraq. James becomes addicted to the thrill of danger, becoming himself a bomb of anxiety ready to explode. Critical coverage of the eventual Best Picture winner, of course, took the time to detail Bigelow's genuine mastery of action sequences but it just as frequently paused to reflect on the apparent contradiction she represented. She's a woman, but she refused to be boxed in and has never made a romantic drama or comedy. She's a woman, but she deserves to be recognized as one of cinema's most astute analysts, male or female, of masculine identity. The tone of these articles frames her rejection of typically feminine topics and genres as a compliment, That is, in its own weird way, liberating. Bigelow's success chipped away at stereotypes about what women like and what they can make. But at the same time, it also provides a glimpse into the routine dismissal of traditionally feminine stories. While films that foreground a female experience rarely win Best Picture, films that explore the traumas of war, and particularly the effects on veterans, have long been a favorite of the Academy, from All Quiet on the Western Front, to The Best Years of Our Lives, to The Deer Hunter. 
In other words, Bigelow's interests happen to align with the visual and thematic languages we already understand to be worthy of prestige. The Hurt Locker provided an update to this genre for audiences saturated with debates over the Iraq War. Released shortly after the election of Barack Obama, the film coincided with growing discontent over the war and its impact not only on the entire Middle East, but also on the psychological well-being of American soldiers. It's interesting to situate Zhao's work as a genre filmmaker here, particularly with respect to how Nomadland was marketed during award season. I happened to catch a literal documentary about the making of Nomadland that aired on primetime network television one weekend. It was of course fascinating to get a behind the scenes look at how the film was made, but it was also fascinating to pick out the themes the documentary obviously wanted you to notice. Though not stated explicitly, it essentially sold Nomadland as an update of the American Western, a lone traveler spending nights under the stars, embarking on a journey through the frontier, and ultimately finding some truth along the way. Though led by an actress, it didn't try to sell itself as a film about women's issues or identity in the way that, for example, a promising young woman or little women do. Instead, it professes to examine humanity or personhood more broadly, in a way that I found very refreshing, to be honest. The documentary emphasized the working class, feeling lost and coping with the modern economy, and most importantly, that Chloe Zhao, a native of China, was really able to see the United States, that she could translate for or communicate with communities that are often overlooked by Hollywood, but are integral parts of the American story. It's also interesting that, with just three features under her belt, this same confusion over a woman who makes masculine stories has already occurred with Zhao. Her second film, The Writer, which, controversial opinion, may be better than Nomadland, prompted one journalist in 2017 to write, wait, a female director making uniquely male stories? As if that, in and of itself, was groundbreaking. And this happened a lot with The Writer. You know, what did draw you to, to tell a story yeah. about a kind? It's the curse of every female filmmaker to constantly be asked what it's like to be a woman in film. Bigelow, given her status as the first woman to win the Best Director Oscar, has been asked this a million times, and she never seems particularly comfortable answering it. And frankly, why would she? It's an awful question, and every iteration of it is sloppier than the next. Is it completely comfortable with you running a show that's just boys? She typically acknowledges that she's honored for the recognition she's received, carefully positions herself as simply a filmmaker, and not in explicit terms as a woman filmmaker or a feminist filmmaker, before pivoting back to her work. Manola Dargis wrote of her in the New York Times in 2010, her insistence on keeping the focus on her movies is a quiet yet profound form of rebellion. She might be a female director, but by refusing to accept that gender designation or even engage with it, she is asserting her right to simply be a director. While this is true, and also probably Bigelow's goal, I also think that her avoidance of these labels helps mitigate the threat she poses to the status quo. As Reed Johnson bluntly put it in an LA Times profile of her just a few weeks before she won an Oscar, in the old boys club that is modern Hollywood, there are few sure ways to kill off a promising film career than by getting yourself labeled a feminist director. Even Dargis hypothesized that Bigelow had to avoid labeling her journey as a woman director difficult because that might have pegged Miss Bigelow as a whiner, as in whiny woman. It may not be a coincidence then that the first woman to ever be nominated for Best Director, Lena Wertmuller for Seven Beauties in 1975, aka the height of the women's movement, publicly rejected feminism. Or that women like Agnes Varda or Barbara Streisand, who more overtly declare their personal politics or draw attention to inequities, have never been recognized for their direction, at least in competition. Jane Campion also called the Academy's Best Director statistics unequal and embarrassing, which is both absolutely true and far more forward than what we've seen from more recent nominees. While I doubt that every female filmmaker would want to be labeled a feminist filmmaker in 2021, given the term implies certain topics or themes, the tenor of this conversation has changed considerably. At a time when this issue is front page news and new milestones are heralded as positive change, 
the term carries a less precarious taboo than it did even 10 years ago. Zhao, for example, doesn't shy away from it. A graduate of Mount Holyoke, a women's college, Seven Sisters Wada, she has described herself as your poster child of a feminist. After one journalist again asked her why she'd want to make a movie about a male character, she went on to explain that for her, feminism encompasses not just exploring the portrayal of women, but also the portrayal of men in a male-dominated industry. This brand of subtlety, or perhaps indirectness, in Zhao's storytelling became one of the sources for one of the noisiest criticisms of Nomadland, that it didn't do enough to admonish Amazon, given the company's dismal treatment of warehouse workers. Alison Wilmore asked Zhao about this for Vulture. The restraint when it comes to editorializing has led some viewers to call Nomadland apolitical. Zhao finds this baffling. Amazon, Zhao believes, is an easier villain than the structural issues that enable camper force to exist, which is why she filmed the warehouse scenes the same way she did the scenes of Fern cleaning toilets on a campground and shoveling beets in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Funnily enough, this same criticism followed Bigelow throughout her press tour for The Hurt Locker, and she answered with a comparable response. But you're not a political filmmaker, as has been pointed out several times. Are you more well, aesthetic than that? I think that, uh, I, I think that if you mean avoiding politics, do I avoid, I avoid speeches mm. in films, but not, not politics. And finger pointing. And finger pointing, yeah. exactly. To me, the question isn't really, can the Academy accept a female filmmaker? It can. The question is, what kind of female filmmaker? Making what kind of film? We know the Academy prefers certain themes, genres, and perspectives. And the way that a woman responds to what the Academy deems important enough can determine her success. But that's not all. Now is probably a good time to point out another common thread among a majority of the seven women nominees, their whiteness. Relative to other major categories, the Best Director Oscar does fairly well with diversity. Alejandro Iñárritu, Ang Lee, Bong Joon-ho, Alfonso Cuarón, with one major exception. No Black person has ever won the Best Director Oscar. No Black woman has ever even been nominated. Following the same trend as female filmmakers, the Black men who have been win for writing their films, not directing them. As Todd Boyd of the University of Southern California told the New York Times in an article last year about the lack of Black directors represented in the Criterion Collection, it's not the segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever kind of racism. It's the sort of racism rooted in assumptions about what's relevant, what's significant, what's worth seeing, what's important. When you're a criterion and you have the ability to stamp something and say, this is valuable, but the list only includes certain films and certain filmmakers, that speaks for itself. If someone looking at it doesn't see any black filmmakers, without even thinking about it, they'd probably assume that black filmmakers aren't that important, or at least that they don't make the kind of critically acclaimed movies you might see in the collection. This quote could just as easily work for the Academy. So just as often as these institutional stamps of approval feel celebratory and exciting, they can also feel exclusionary and reinforce the same canon they profess they want to disrupt. It's clear that Hollywood has discovered it can make money on telling the stories of institutions that have failed in their missions. The most consistent trend across Oscar-nominated films this year was biases inherent in the American justice system, particularly with regards to race. Trial of the Chicago Seven, Judas and the Black Messiah, The United States vs. Billie Holiday, Two Distant Strangers. The industry celebrates, and more importantly profits from, these concepts, but more often than not, chooses not to award the individuals who guided those concepts to fruition. As I watched Chloe Zhao repeatedly win Best Director this year at various award shows, I kept thinking about a quote I read when I was researching my video about Halle Berry's Best Actress win. Ruben Cannon, the first Black casting director for a major movie studio, told one paper, It is significant, but we should not mistake a moment for a movement. He was warning audiences not to blindly accept that things had changed because of her historic achievement, because without widespread demands for and efforts at change, Barry would simply become an anomaly, and no real progress would occur. Cannon was right. 20 years later, Barry remains the only woman of color to have won the Best Actress Award. So as I watched Zhao finally step up to the podium to receive her Oscar, I wondered, 
is this a moment or a movement? Like I said at the beginning of this video, awareness isn't really the problem. The numbers are everywhere, and although the execution of efforts at change have felt underwhelming to say the least, I think we have room to be cautiously optimistic. New barriers are broken every single year. New fellowships enable underrepresented groups to join the industry. Streaming services are democratizing access to underrecognized filmmakers. Just this past month, I've seen more people discover Elaine May for the first time precisely because the Criterion channel made a new leaf available to stream. Representation isn't the key to liberation in a structural or political sense, but I still think it's important nonetheless to advocate for equality where we can. These problems will not disappear organically. To me, the Oscars are part of the problem, but they're also part of the solution. And there are plenty of other ways that the industry could approach change here too. Netflix could lift up and coming women out of algorithm jail, or at least commit more than it costs for one episode of The Crown to these efforts. HBO could trust talented women like Andrea Arnold instead of ripping creative control out of her hands. Most importantly, studios can give women more than one opportunity to see their vision through. Let them become the auteurs history never allowed them to be. Chloe Zhao is one step toward making these goals a reality. Thank you again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Don't forget, you can get a huge discount on a two-year plan of NordVPN at nordvpn.com slash BeKindRewind. And when you use my code BeKindRewind, you'll get an extra month free.